All right, mixing console uh, overview demonstration number two. This is for the Digico SD9 um, with a few accessories. Uh, some of that's pretty obvious and apparent from the um, from this uh, just this opening overview, but uh, I'll kind of go go over it from top down. Dead center in the middle, uh, you're definitely just seeing the, uh, the mixing console surface. That's, um, you know, pretty common as far as this one is, you know, it's a digital mixing console, uh, was introduced around 2009, I believe, but it's been able to, uh, maintain a lot of relevance through the, um, uh, the fact that, that Digico has been a, a fantastic advocate for staying on top of uh, making sure their uh, all their stuff has has been uh, future proof. Um, uh, a couple of things that may be different to some of these standard deployments of this that are uh, apparent right off the bat are the fact that it's in this um, kind of unique looking uh, travel case. Uh, the case includes uh housing uh for the actual surface itself um a bit of an expanded doghouse which that's the area behind where all the connections are made um and then a couple of monitors here both of these monitors uh stay attached uh to the uh to the case chassis the entire time they're fully articulating they actually fold back in um to rest directly behind this doghouse area, which would be behind the two little monitor speakers that you're seeing um, when it's um, uh, when it's in stow and travel. And uh, another really, uh, the biggest advantage to this case itself is the surface and um, uh, entire assembly uh, are actually able to, uh, they, um, I call them a, it's a self-tipping mechanism. So basically, once it's uh, once everything, once all the monitors are collapsed in, uh, I can actually this uh, unit is actually on a pivot where I can actually lift the surface itself, hold it with one hand, open these two uh, compartments here, which actually fold out to become somewhat of a barn door effect. The whole thing actually just folds down in, making this somewhat of a monstrous setup for a mid-sized console able to be set up by one person. It's got its pros and cons like everything else. Uh, the pro is, again, going back to the fact that I can set this whole thing up if I can roll it in place by myself. Uh, the con would be um, because of having that uh, capacity, it is, uh, it's a bit of a monster to move. Uh, it's very large and quite heavy. So if you've got a load-in scenario where there's um, a lot of stairs or anything to that like, um, then it's somewhat of a, then it, it's, it starts to become less and less practical, um, which is why, you know, try to stay versatile and use the right, uh, the right tools for the right job. Um, so moving a little, uh, a little further into some of the finer points on just the overview here, um, again, as I mentioned before, you can see two different monitor screens. The one on the left is actually d connected directly to the video output of the, uh, of the console itself. This is an overview screen, kind of gives me an overall picture of everything going on input and output wise. For this particular session I have open right now, I'm actually taking advantage of using a lot of the inputs and outputs, so that screen looks fairly populated. Uh, the one on the right, is actually connected to a computer that is in another small option rack off to my right. Uh, this is actually the same model of computer that I spoke about in my Waves LV1 video. That is, um, uh, but it is the Axis One, and for this for this version, it's actually running a host program called Super Rack. This is the um, uh, this is basically how. I'm able to incorporate um, low latency waves uh, plug-in instantiations for um, to be inserted in um, on channel strips, 
uh, bus processing and effects processing within the console and being able to use those within the existing uh, channel layout and bus infrastructure uh, that, it, that already exists. Um, I like having that availability. It's uh, uh, Waves Audio that makes a variety of units that I'm quite familiar with and I've gotten accustomed to using over the years with either being able to incorporate it in this setup or the native Waves Mixer uh, Emotion LV1. Um, so being able to have that familiarity going back and forth between the platforms is just a, it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's a familiar Sonic character and it's just something that is, that comes in very handy. So this rack again contains a computer and at the very bottom, it's a little hard to see, but you can see the blue light. That is the, uh, that's the server that does the, uh, does the processing to make sure these things are all super low latency. Um, so that's sort of the overview of the surface, the case, and some of the accessories that would normally be at front of house. At this point in time, I do have uh, the same front of house drive rack connected here that if you <clears throat> had the opportunity to see the LV1 video that I also posted, um, that talks a little bit of, uh, in a little bit more detail about how some of these, um, components are incorporated and it's actually the same way. I have this this rack set up to where it's basically a, um, uh, I can use it in the very same way that I would use it on the Waves LV1 software, but I can incorporate it into this uh, larger format tactile infrastructure as well. Um, and because the networking protocol that uh, Waves uses um, uh, being SoundGrid um, is communicable between these devices in such a way, again, I'm paraphrasing, not going into great detail, but it's um, because of that, it enables me to basically take a single network cable from this overall setup here and connect it. And, and as such, I have the exact same type of input and output capacity and the ability to use some of the, um, uh, the more high-end analog gear, um, being able to use some of the AES functions to for PA drive capacity via the lake and things. A um, little similar to how I did that with um, uh, with the LV1. Um, <clears throat> power is the exact same on it. So basically, I've just got it sort of set up here as the overall premium option. Um, so outside of the primary front of house, um, uh, SD9s, um, uh, when they were, uh, when they were first released and still to this date, their primary method of transport has been a type of MADI connection, which is called MADI C or also maybe referred to as MADI TP, which stands for MADI twisted pair. So that's not a networking protocol per se, but that's actually just, uh, uh, MADI bidirectional audio over and it's um and the the transport is done over a uh, a uh, category type cable uh in this case it's a shielded ethernet cable that is built and designed to a certain specification um digico did manufacture some uh some stage box racks that included this type of connection as a native connection option for my purpose here uh i'll go ahead and kind of walk around here to the stage box uh, and you'll notice this is the this is the Digico SD rack uh, by default they did not uh, make this rack with that type of connection uh, so it has a standard MADI connection which any of you that are familiar with MADI protocol knows that the standard MADI connection is done over a B and C connector um, so that's where this uh, the little red box comes into play. Um, basically, I'm able to use the MADI C or MADI TP uh, port on the console and connect it directly to uh, the red box. The red box actually, um, it can perform a few different functions, but in this case, it's merely taking that and converting it to a uh, to the BNC type connectors, um, which then enable me to connect it to the rack and I have the exact same type of functionality 
um, as far as um, connectivity. Um, basically the advantage to going uh, with this rack versus uh, some of the others that are natively uh, Maddie C is that this particular rack is fully modular uh, in terms of inputs and outputs. So I have uh, um, cards there that it's 48 channels of uh, very high-end uh, microphone preamplifiers. Um, and then that's all the blue cards that you see. Directly next to that is AES-3 digital audio, eight channels of that going in and eight channels of that going out, followed by two other cards of just regular analog output options. Um, and then I have one, two, three, four, five slots that are open that are not being used on the output side right now. Um, and again, uh, because of the way I have it configured right now, um, that's just regular category cable, just a single cable, because I'm typically running all these sessions at a uh, native sample rate of 48K. Um, that is a single cable uh, going from the front of house setup, which would be this over here, to the stage. Right now I just have a little 25 foot piece of shielded Ethercon cable in between them because I'm in my garage test environment, not on a live show uh, setup, like um, pretty much the rest of the live events world right now. So again, uh, same um, same idea for um, for this one. If anyone is interested in um, knowing about any process or anything like that, as to how these things work together. If you'd like to know any specifics on them, let me know. Let me know in the comments. Uh, ask me um, anything like that. I'd be happy to go through anything as far as uh, any um, connection specifics or anything that, any questions you might um, have as far as this is concerned. So again, hope you're all doing well and uh, look forward to hearing from you all soon in the future. All right, cheers folks.